come in today to this MCLA training. You get one unit for training. And we're very fortunate to have Ellen Bacon and Wiley, our presenter today. Um, she's uh, just a real authority on the case law. She keeps up much more than most of us do. <laughs> and uh, so uh, thank you, Ellen. Do you have any questions on things you want to help afterwards? Or do Please. you want the questions help after the presentation? Thanks, Ellen. All right, thanks. All right, so for those of you who have never been to one of my case law reviews before, we have round rules, and here they are. I can't go through every case in detail. I focus on the ones that I think are most relevant to what we do on a daily basis. Um, my summaries should not substitute for reading your case if you think it might apply to your defense, um, because several bench officers have and will quiz you on facts of cases, so don't use what I said. Uh, my opinions do not serve as those of Ladle, um, I'm 99% sure I didn't include every published case this year, but I tried. And if you have specific questions about the case, please refer to the case first before you ask me questions because as you can see from the size of your handout, I have a lot of cases to get through in the next hour. So that being said, we will start um, with jurisdiction. So I always like to start off with the bad and we have Enray DP that came out of Santa Clara County where they found, uh, they, the Court of Appeal affirmed a finding of a subdivision C count for an infant. Um, hopefully those of you who've been around long enough are thinking, well, that's impossible, but I'll tell you how it is possible. And it's, it's a bad opinion, so if you do have, I'm not sure LA's gotten wind of this in their filings. I haven't seen C counts on infants, but there's some specific facts that probably will help you. Um, basically, the mother, the, the parents, the mother and the her boyfriend got into a big altercation. Um, when the child was detained, the mother admitted that um, the father drinks every day. He's really angry. He fights with her all the time. The mother had half siblings who were already in the system because of domestic violence with this guy as her boyfriend. Mother had participated in programs and still didn't get the problem. And she had a long history of DV relationships even before she hooked up with this guy. So. The court, the court of Appeal looked at whether or not the child is suffering serious emotional harm or there's a substantial risk of emotional harm. And they, in this opinion, really focused on the second prong, which is the risk factor. Now, for those of you who are familiar or had C cases you've had to litigate, you know about Bryson C. So go back and reread Bryson C and compare the two because Bryson set forth a three-prong standard which isn't addressed at all by this opinion. Instead, the court focuses on the behavior of the mother and the factual differences between Bryce and C, who was a resilient child where the parents were motivated to learn from their past mistakes and their, their previous problems with one another, um, as opposed to really teasing out the statute and deciding what it needs to mean. So I'm letting you know if you do have um, a, D, a, a C count on an infant, unfortunately, under this case, it can be sustained, but there is room to make an argument to distinguish it. All right, NRA, um, MW, I put a lot of facts in here. Um, this is an LA case. Um, the <laughs> This one cracks me up. Okay, because the mother had a history of substance abuse. The father had zero recent contact with the children because he had been incarcerated on assault charges. He also was a registered sex offender. Um, he had been arrested in 2007 for domestic violence. At that point, mother said, I don't need a protective order, everything's fine. They filed a 342. Um, mother said, I didn't have any contact with father. Um, I'd taken appropriate measures, and I didn't know about his criminal history or his, his um, status as a registered sex offender. The juvenile court said mother should have known of father's criminal history. She should have known of his sex offender status because had she obtained that protective order back in 2007, she would have gotten a class and then she would have known that he was a sex offender and that he was a criminal. Well, guess what? Fortunately, our court of appeals said, I don't think so. Um, they basically said that mother was under no obligation to seek a protective order because it was a single act of domestic violence and that that one failure or refusal to attain the protective order didn't rise to placing the children at risk 
and the Court of Appeals said, no, there's no, we have zero reason to think that that protective order would have led to mother's knowledge that father was a registered sex offender. So um, that went away. This, if there's one case to star, this is it. Okay, this is an LA case. Spanking of children does not constitute serious physical harm. Um, the children, the children were detained after mother was assaulted and raped by the father of one of the children. And I'm sorry, I'm giggling. The reason I'm giggling is because on that count, the department added mother failed to protect the children from witnessing the assault on her. Uh, which fortunately was dismissed by the juvenile court. The mother admitted to spanking the children on the hand or sandal. Um, the department, of course, applied the physical abuse, and the court sustained opining that physical abuse was never appropriate. Um, the court of appeal reversed. And these you need to commit these to memory when you have a physical abuse case. The court has to con the court needs to consider whether the act was genuinely disciplinary. Was it done as a disciplinary measure as opposed to a parent losing their cool and just wailing on the child? Was it warranted, necessary, was it warranted by the circumstances of whatever the incident was? And was the amount of punishment reasonable or excessive? That was the test that was set forth. Um, the court said there's no blanket rule that spanking or even hitting with a sandal is physical abuse. It goes all the way through the statutory history of A. It's a great case to read um, if you have a physical abuse spanking case coming up. Um, Mia Z is an F case that came out of Department 409. The mother's lack of supervision was found to be casually connected to the death of a child. Um, the child was killed by a, a large iron gate on the parent's property that fell onto her. Um, the department filed a petition under F alleging mother's neglectful conduct caused the death. There was testimony at trial including mother's landlord stating that these kids were basically running amok all the time, that mother had a history of leaving the children unattended in dangerous situations. And so the court sustained the F and the B in the mother appeal. Um, the, the test that the Court of Appeal used is a lot more detailed, but the gist of it basically is if the actor had not acted wrongfully, his or her conduct generally cannot be deemed a substantial factor in the harm. Um, but because this mom had was on notice that there were dangerous conditions around the unit, had been seen by multiple people just not paying attention to her children, um, the Court of Appeal affirmed the F count um, because mother's conduct was casually connected to the death of the child. Um, another C count, um, Enrique KS, this is San Benito County. Um, the mother, the, the mother in this case was an adoptive mother. Um, she qualified for the adoption assistance program. She switched her insurance program. Um, there was a lot of back and forth between counties. Um, local mental health provider, mom knew the child specifically needed reactive attachment disorder. The mother switched her insurance plan so that the child could be seen by them. The child's behaviors continued to escalate. Um, child needed a psychiatric hold, and mom said, I'm not picking the child up. So the agency filed under C and G. I will say, based on KS, the Court of Appeal really did seem to appear to attach a heightened standard to this mom, because this mom was also a licensed social worker who had worked for a child protective services <coughs> agency. Um, so I do think that the Court of Appeal was a little harsher on her than <coughs> a normal parent. Um, they affirmed the trial court's judgment, noting that mother had never secured specialized therapy even though she was aware of the facilities that offered it. She had been receiving a, quote, sizable monthly grant for the child's special needs. She had been rejecting opinions of the professionals at Behavior Health, and she displayed a lack of insight that her role had in prohibiting the um, appropriate care. So they uh, sustained the C-count, but like I said, I do think that they applied a, a heightened standard based on mom's occupation. I see um, this, I threw in here, and you can read it at your leisure, but note that this is up on, uh, in the Supreme Court. And it has to do with hearsay and the um, standard of 
substantial evidence of truthfulness when we're dealing with minors out of court statements on D cases. Okay. Um, jurisdiction dispo. So this is sort of a, a hybrid one. So the first case I have under here is a 387. Um, here out of LA, there was a 387 petition filed. The first, the original one was um, DV. The children remained with mom. There was another DV incident. The mother fled with the child to Texas, and the department filed a 387 asking to remove from mom. Um, by the time the jurisdiction hearing came around, the warrants were outstanding for the mother and the child. And the father argued that the court could not proceed on the 387 petition in the absence of the mother and child. And the court, well, they did it anyway. And the dad appealed. The Court of Appeal said that father was not prejudiced by the court proceeding. Of course, mom didn't appeal because she's somewhere in Texas. Um, and so they basically said, well, we can't show that father was harmed because father had the ability to introduce evidence and testify, and his inability to cross-examine mom, the Court of Appeal felt, was not prejudicial. Um, they said that Baby Boy M and its progeny don't apply because the only issue at the 387 is whether the child should be removed from mother's custody. And the court already had jurisdiction under, under Section 300. Um, so whether the father had caused the injuries to mother was not material, according to the Court of Appeal, um, because the cross-examination of mother on father's actions would not have affected the outcome. And the court also upheld the dispositional orders removing child from mother's custody. Had mom been around and appealed, this may have been a different um, result, but I think they really kind of tried to do away with it since it was father who appealed and really couldn't show um, prejudice. All right, so disposition cases, we still have this year a lot of um, non-custodial parent cases, so um, read them at your leisure. Um, first one is out of Riverside County, in Ray KB, um, the father was in the military, he was stationed in Italy, then he came to Virginia, um, the, the report on father was very positive, the mother appealed after the court sent the child to the father and closed the case um, because she thought that it would be detrimental to the child. The Court of Appeal affirmed and said that mom failed to pr pr prove under 361.2 the detriment by clear and convincing. Um, the, the, the facts that the Court of Appeal cited was that the child's bond with the maternal family was not sufficient detriment um, because there was no evidence that he would be emotionally devastated placed with father. Lack of contact between the child and the father is not a basis for finding detriment on its own and terminating the dependency jurisdiction was also reasonable um, under NRA King. Okay, here's another bad one. NRA BH came out of San Bernardino County. It basically says B10 can apply to a non-custodial parent. Um, so the two-year-old son was removed um, on the basis that the father had a long criminal history. Um, the court denied father under B-10 because he had failed to reunify with a half-sibling that was in court because of domestic violence. So on appeal, the father claimed it was error because he was a non-custodial parent of the half-sibling, and so B-10 should not apply, and San Bernardino County disagreed. So what's interesting to me is father did not challenge in his appeal whether or not he previously failed to reunify as that what that means in terms of as a non-custodial parent can you fail to reunify and the father never addressed whether he made a reasonable effort to ameliorate the conditions leading to the prior dependency case this appeal only focused on the non-custodial issue um, and they they did say in the in the opinion that there was insufficient evidence that other half sibling was removed because father was non-custodial so it's, I'm not quite sure how the appellate attorney tried to set it up, because of course we don't have the luxury of reading the briefs, just the opinions, um, but it seems like there was a lot more that could have been done on this case, in my humble opinion. Um, and the Court of Appeals said that although Section 361.5 includes language removed from parents, the court determined the legislature had not intended to limit its application to, non -cust to custodial parents only. 
So watch for this one. Um, again, it's San Bernardino County, so it's persuasive, not binding. NRA EG is a very recent case um, that just came down in May out of Orange County um, where the Court of Appeal held that if a parent fails treatment under Penal Code 1000, which is the deferred entry of judgment, that can constitute court-ordered treatment under B13. Um, they, because they, and I put their reasoning on the slide, it arises in an unrelated criminal proceeding and it carries the risk of jail time. So they sort of analogize the Penal Code 1000 program as analogous to parole or probation. Um, they did, however, remand it for a determination on whether a mother actually resisted treatment by opting for prison time instead of the program. So there wasn't a whole lot of information. Mom did testify that she went to prison instead of doing the program, so they remanded it for that information. Um, but watch those because they can, according to this opinion, constitute your flesh uh, B13. Okay, relative placement. Um, first one is Joshua A that came out of San Diego. Um, the Joshua um, was 12 or 13, detained because of mother's alcohol use, and mother um, wanted him to be released to her boyfriend. The court said he doesn't qualify as a nerfum, and Josh, Joshua, again, who was, you know, old enough to say, said, I don't, I don't want to go with this guy. Um, and the Court of Appeal affirmed. Uh, they did, however, note that Mother's Boyfriend did qualify as a nerfum um, at, under the definition in the statute, but they said that it, it, the court was not required to actually evaluate the Mother's Boyfriend because there was no showing it was in Joshua's best interest. Okay, Isabella G. came out of L.A. County in March. I get a lot of questions about this, okay? Um, it does not say that the relative placement preference applies all the way until TPR. It's very, Isabella G. is very factually specific. So if you're running into court to argue Isabella G., you better make sure you have read the case. <coughs> not rely on my slot, okay? Um, in this case, over and over and over, the grandparents requested to be assessed, and the court ordered it, and the agent and the department did not do it. Over and over and over. Starting before dispo. A detention. They were requesting it. So following the time when FR was terminated, the grandparents <laughs> filed a 388 petition, and the court denied it. And the grandparents appealed it. And in that one, they, the Court of Appeal did reverse, said that 361.3 mandates relative placement, and because the agency failed to fulfill its obligation to assess, the relative should not have had to have brought the 388 petition. It's, but again, it's very factually specific. It is not a blanket opinion that says, hey, assessment, relative placement for everybody until, until termination of parental rights. Um, the, and the information, unfortunately, that was given this, to these relatives was egregious. Um, the department said, well, you, Grandma, you don't qualify because you have a criminal conviction. She gives them the, the document saying it had been dismissed. Um, then they said, well, it doesn't matter because now we've placed her with a NERFM. And the NERFM comes back and says, I'm not a permanent placement option. And then the relatives again said, hey, why don't you assess us? And then the department said, well, you know what? The kid's been replaced twice, so you're going to have to wait at least a year before we can look at you again. Um, and they were told under Cesar V that they would only be assessed if there was a change of placement. So like I said, it's very, it's factually, it's a great case for relatives, but it's pretty factually specific. Um, if you really want to read it, you can tell I don't think much of this case. <laughs> it's a battle between foster parents having to do with 388 petitions and abusive discretion and which foster parents should get the baby. If you really want to read it, uh, feel free. I think I just wrote foster parents battle on it. All right, this year we did have a lot of cases on ICWA. And good or bad, it's not just notices like we've seen in the past. We didn't just get notice sucks, do it again. Um, we did get some really good, um, comprehensive ICWA cases. Let's see, maybe the first one's not one of them. Okay, <laughs> Henry AC um, came down of San Diego. Um, there were a lot of 
different claims in this one um, from the 12 month review hearing. Basically, the father said that he was rendered ineffective assistance of counsel. The Court of Appeal did away with all of those, saying they were harmless. Um, the father claimed that there was no testimony um, to support the detriment to return and active effort. So if you have any of those issues, you can read it. It wasn't, it wasn't the best one in this section. Um, Enray A.L., again, out of San Diego, um, the Court of Appeal did find that it was air for the juvenile court to refuse to hear, um, no, I'm sorry, further testimony on the agency's active efforts during a termination hearing. The, the crux of this case is that California and federal law differ in regards to whether an active efforts finding needs to be made at the permanency hearing. For those of you who are unfamiliar with ICWA, I'm sorry if I am making your brain spin around in your head. Um, as opposed, and, and just generally, in ICWA cases, as opposed to a reasonable efforts finding, the court's required to find an active efforts finding. So that's what we're, we're talking about here. Um, the trial court in this case did not make an active efforts finding at the permanency hearing, and San Diego, at least for now, is saying yes, that active efforts has to be made at the permanency hearing. NRA ER. Um, this one was hard for me to put a lot of information because the facts and background of this case were not certified for publication. So there's just a little blurb on the law which makes it a little hard to follow when you don't know what the facts are. But basically, the mother revoked the Indian custodian designation, so that custodian had no right to ICWA notices. <laughs> there you go. And here, just because I had to stick it in, that we do still have um, TPRs. This is out of Riverside County, reverse for failure to provide with notice. Um, the department basically attempted to use to notify the BIA. They used the wrong form. They didn't provide the necessary information. And then father again, um, once the kids were removed from mom, again he claimed ICWA, and again they did it wrong. In Ray Isaiah W is a very recent case um, out of our Supreme Court in California, um, basically stating that if a parent does not appeal or appeals from Juris Dispo and does not raise ICWA, it does not preclude them from raising ICWA after a TPR as a, a challenge. Um, the, in this particular case, at adjudication, the court removed the newborn, found ICWA didn't apply, neither parent appealed the Juris Dispo orders. Um, a year later, when mother's rights were terminated, her appellate attorney did claim that ICWA, there was an ICWA violation, and the Court of Appeals said, too bad, so sad, you didn't appeal from DISPO when you had ICWA then too, so you don't get it now. And the Supreme Court actually reversed the Court of Appeal. Um, because the juvenile court has an affirmative and continuing duty in all dependency proceedings to, require, to inquire into a child's Indian status, and even though the juvenile court found no ICWA dispo, it had an affirmative and ongoing duty to determine ICWA's applicability at TPR. So the fact that mom didn't challenge it at TPR does not, or excuse me, a jurist does not preclude her from challenging it at TPR. Um, Enray Alexandra P., um, also a very recent case out of LA, and if Jessica Jorgensen was here, I would give her mad props. Um, this case is a bane <laughs> on our courthouse. This case went up to the <coughs> Court of Appeals three times. And if you read the opinion, Hellman got it wrong, Trenda Costa got it wrong, and wouldn't you know Judge Diaz in 419 got it wrong? <laughs> wouldn't you know? Um, the issue uh, on this case is whether or not there's good cause to depart from ICWA's placement preferences. The tribe, the department, and the minor's attorney all wanted Alexandria placed with what we would call a NERFA. It was a kind of a, a, a extended relative of father who had the enrollment in the Choctaw tribe. The foster parents who were here um, didn't want this child to go. They wanted to adopt this little girl. Um, and there were long hearings over it. Um, and twice it had to go up because the Pelman and Trendacosta both used the wrong standard. Um, the court, sorry, the court, Pelman and Trendacosta used that the de facto's have not proven by clear and convincing evidence that it was a certainty the child would suffer emotional harm. 
That's not the standard. The de facto is needed to show by clear and convincing evidence there's a significant risk that the child will suffer serious harm as a result as a change in placement. And the child's best interest is a factor, but only one. And when the interests of an Indian child are being considered, the importance of preserving the familiar and cultural connections are incredibly important and can't be separate. Um, the history of it was that the, these adoptive um, relatives had contacted the department in 2011 indicating interest in placement, but father at that time was an FR, they were out of state, they had an approved ICPC. By September of 2012, father had dropped out of the picture. The relatives continued to video chat with Alexandria and saw her in person. Um, after the first appeal, when Pelman was reversed and it was remanded, the de facto parents insisted on being present for all of Alexandria's visits with the relatives. They actually filed a writ um, in the Court of Appeal to prevent, taking, prevent the relatives from taking her to Disneyland. Um, there was evidence that the de facto mom was limiting and interfering in therapy. The dream catcher that Alexandria had made with her Native American therapist had ended up in the trash. <laughs> but the de facto mom testified that they had painted one wall of their kitchen Navajo blue. <laughs> and that they were members of the Autry Museum. Um, so the, the Court of Appeal did the right thing. So this one I, I, I heard, and I didn't see it, but I heard this one has been um, very played out in the press, probably not particularly accurately. And it was unfortunate that it took so long for Diaz to get the case and do it right, um, that it took so long for there to be resolution. But it really, I mean, it really was the right decision because I don't have a very favorable opinion of these uh, parents, right. these foster parents. Um, Abigail A. also very recently came out from the Supreme Court. Um, there's two things you need to know. There's two um, court rules that this, this opinion deals with. The first one is 5.428C, um, which says, after notice, if the tribe responds that a child is eligible for membership, the court must proceed if the child is an Indian child and direct the appropriate agency to provide active efforts to secure membership. Court, Supreme Court says no. What happened in this case was that the father had claimed Indian ancestry. And then after the notice was were sent, the Cherokee tribe responded and said, hey, I think that the children and the dad may be eligible for membership. And the dad said, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So the dad is getting all his stuff and all his documents together. And in the meantime, the court says, well, I'm going to go ahead and treat this like an ICWA case. And so they're making active efforts, findings. They're doing all those things. Um, the department appealed that result and the Supreme Court came down and said that this 5.428C is not right. You can't do it. So they said that it invites unnecessary delay by requiring the court to make efforts to secure membership for children who are not Indian children without regard to the family's wishes and to apply ICWA provisions to children who are not Indian children. So if you have a case where it looks like the kids are eligible. That doesn't automatically mean that the court gets to apply ICWA throughout the pendency of the case. <laughs> what it did find, though, under 5.428C2, that the department, as part of active efforts, has to make efforts to get those kids enrolled. So that stood, the other part fell. OK, that's enough. Let's move to parents. Um, in Enray HR, substantial evidence supports the finding that father was alleged not biological. Um, the, 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 court, the father in this case did not check the box on JV505 asking to be out. Um, he requested a DNA test. He was deported before his sample could be collected. Um, Council requested that this was LA, that father be elevated from alleged to biological. The court said no, and then the court sustained a G count apart against this poor gentleman. Um, the, is, the issue on appeal was can the court properly sustain a G count failure to provide on a man who, is for all intents and purposes, not a parent? And the court of appeal said yes, but again, it was factually specific. Um, Father vacillated between claiming his child and saying, I'm not the dad. Um, he 
asked for the DNA test, which the Court of Appeal kind of used against him. He didn't check the box on the JV505 asking to be out. Um, the court said, you know, if the if the um, juvenile court does not find, does not deny him the last hostage, he shouldn't be part of the dependency case. If a party is shown conclusively that a man's not the biological father, he'll have limited rights. And father's attorney asked to stay on the case. So there, it was very factually specific. I still have, have the opinion that G count shouldn't be sustained against men who don't have an obligation to provide, but I will have to toe my line very carefully. Um, in Ray Donovan, sorry, the it's Donovan L. The the initial got cut off. Um, 